Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, Helena Duncan to lead BCA. Also, Ledbetter announces chairs for important committees. And Steve Marshall sues the Ethics Commission. Should be a fight. And during this match, there will be absolutely no fighting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and no pulling of the nose. Do something about this, ref. Come on, what kind of place you running here? <laughs> and no kicking, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, my Keep it classy, boys. All this and much, much more coming up next on The V. Welcome to The Voice of Alabama Politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and I'm joined today by Susan Britt, research guru extraordinaire, and Josh Moon, columnist and investigative reporter with APR. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Hi, hey, y'all. Filming today outside of beautiful downtown Atala once again. <laughs> nice. Always beautiful this time of year. Yes, oh, it yeah. is. It's, it's so warm outside that I saw a polar bear in a puffer. Uh, I mean, it's just crazy. I do want do want to give our uh, viewers an update. Uh, you know, uh, Charlie Walker, her sister, uh, was a victim in the Walmart shooting in Chesapeake, Virginia. Uh, she was one of two that uh, have survived being shot. She was shot multiple times. She has had multiple surgeries, but we are happy to be able to announce. Mm-hmm that she is on the mend and they expect her to recover. It will be a long recovery, uh, learning to walk and and learning to speak and things like that. But she is alive and and improving every day. I believe the doctor's saying if she continues on this this trajectory, she should be home by Christmas. So Hmm. but it is Josh. Just amazing. (laughs) Yeah. Shot six times, our understanding is shot six times. Uh, twice in the abdomen, twice, once in each uh, side of her shoulder, and twice in the face. And uh, it, it, she is a walking miracle, as she they is. say. Yes. She is. Yeah, so we're thankful oh, for just, that, and the family is too. Yeah. What were you going to say, so, Josh? I, I just, uh, it's man, it's just, from where we started with this, uh, the day after the shooting, uh, to, to where we are now, is, is really, you know, really kind of nothing short of a miracle. Um, yeah. and you know, it's, uh, I, I hate like hell what happened to her. Um, but and, you know, I, I'm, I'm so thankful that, uh, that they're going to, uh, to, to at least have her home by Christmas and that, and that she looks like she's going to survive this and, and hopefully li- live a nice long life. Uh, hopefully so. And every, everything points in that direction. And that, that is, yeah. that is a nice gift for the holidays for everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, Josh, we've been reporting on this for a while, but there's a new wrinkle. Uh, the Attorney General, Steve Marshall, is suing the Ethics Commission. Now, this is yes. over uh, an opinion that they issued that I think you and I both wrote about, mm-hmm. where they say that they are not re- they're not responsible to give out exculpatory evidence they find when carrying out a ethics investigation. In other words, if they find something out that might exonerate Mm -hmm. the person they're investigating, they're not obligated to turn that over to the defense or anyone else. They can keep that secret. But but that is the case that that is not the case in the regular situation of law where they do have to to give the information. The ethics commission has taken upon themselves to say, Oh no, we're above the law. We don't have to do that. And and that's the way we've taken it. That to mean Mm -hmm. that that's exactly what they they mean they they don't have to give information that would help clear someone's name. Right. Uh, Steve Marshall now, and I say to his credit, is uh, challenging that in court. You you you've spoken to both sides on this, Josh. Yeah, um, and uh, and I say on the on the face of this, um, I, I don't necessarily understand the position uh, from the outset 
uh, it, let's just say, let's just take the blanket thing of saying, okay, we don't, if we find exculpatory evidence, we don't have to give it to you, okay, right. or, or to say it. Well, if you find exculpatory evidence, why in the hell would you continue? You know, why <laughs> Why would you just not shut it down and say, okay, well, the guy uh, clearly didn't do this. Let's, let's move on. Um, but I also understand their their point of view uh, because it doesn't just cover exculpatory evidence it also uh, you know covers impeachment evidence which is basically saying that uh, a witness is not credible in someone's opinion and i think this is kind of where this thing started uh between the ag's office and uh and the ethics commission was uh, the ag's office believed that someone uh was not a credible witness against uh, the subject of an investigation and they went back and forth about this, and and that's when the ethics commission basically said, "Listen, we don't we don't have any responsibility to make that determination. We're doing this so y'all can make this determination." And I think that's kind of the key here is um, the the ethics commission kind of views itself as sort of a glorified grand jury, and they're saying, "Listen, even if we don't do this." We serve essentially the same function as a grand jury. And in the grand jury, they're also not not going to tell you about the exculpatory evidence. They're also not going to tell the grand jury about these things that are happening. And they're going to return an indictment that becomes a public indictment and somebody's going to get indicted without ever even giving that person an opportunity to defend themselves. Oftentimes, some of the people don't even know that they're under investigation before the indictment hits. Right. And so they said, at least in our case, we give them an opportunity to present their side, and then we forward that on to a law enforcement agency or the DA's office to investigate fully, and they're responsible at that point before it ever goes to trial for returning over the exculpatory evidence that's there. And so that's their side of this. I, I tend to, tend to uh, think, because of all the people I've talked to over the years and all the many years we've looked at the uh, Ethics Commission, that they are so willful sometimes in cases mm -hmm where it goes beyond what a grand jury would ever think of doing because yeah. they just want to get somebody. They, they, there's, there is an attitude sometimes of what, you know, legally called uh, uh, selective and vindictive prosecution. Right. I'm not accusing them of doing that, but I'm saying there's an error about that. There's also what? that error in Steve Marshall's attorney general's office where we know that people have been exonerated by the Ethics Commission only to be picked up and investigated by Steve Marshall's yes. office. Right. And it just smells of politics and yeah. this sort of selective and vindictive prosecution. Yeah, I, I will say in, 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 in regards to the Ethics Commission, I, you know, I don't necessarily buy that they are just basically a glorified grand jury because I think no. that they're, when, when you hear that the Ethics Commission has forwarded somebody on for prosecution, that carries some weight. I mean, it, it, it people does. talk about it in terms of, oh, well, they found them guilty of ethics violations, you know, and, and I, I don't. I think maybe the terminology, maybe it's not the, the Ethics Commission's fault that people have termed it in that way, but that's how people think of it. People think of it as them being guilty. I mean, Robert Bentley <clears throat> was guilty. As soon as they returned that yep. verdict against him, yep. you know, it was, he was guilty. Yep. Well, I remember in the Hubbard case, too, the, the, the ones that uh, involved the, the, him having clients, the one, that, one count that the jury did not find him guilty on was one that was approved by the Ethics Commission. So it does yeah. carry weight. All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it right there. You're watching the Be the Voice of Alabama Politics. There seems to be a new wave of aggressive driving lately. You see those people, they are the ones that are tailgating other people because they have to get through their destination now. Weaving in and out of traffic looks like they could care less about who's around them. There's no one else on the roadway. They're the only one there. Aggressive driving can be the difference between life and death. All because somebody thought they needed to be the front of the line and get there first. Slow down. Don't be the reason that someone else doesn't go home tonight. My dog Jupiter is frightened. When I climb too high, the owl said, Check for monsters, Daddy. I did, honey. There are no monsters. You're perfectly safe.
Protect yourself and those you love. Vaccinate now. Welcome back to The Beat, the voice of Alabama politics. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, you know, we're going to have 26 new members in the House. Uh, Republicans, 20, uh, number number uh, four in the Senate, new Republicans. Right. Uh, but the uh, another interesting thing we're going to have is a new Speaker of the House mm-hmm. and some new committee chairs and Speaker nominate. Uh, Nathaniel Ledbetter this week announced uh, who would be his pick for some of these big uh, positions uh, if he's elected Speaker. And, of course, he will be elected Speaker because the Republicans have 77 seats in the uh, in the House. He will be elected. And I, I imagine Republicans and Democrats will come together on that. Uh, Republican uh, Rep. Joe Lover, Lovern from Auburn will be the Rules Committee uh, He's, he's relatively new, but he's been around mm-hmm. and he's gained respect from folks. Uh, Danny Garrett, Representative Danny Garrett, who has been around for quite some time from Trustville, he will uh, remain the Ways and Means Education Budget Committee Chair. State Rep. Rex Reynolds from Huntsville will be the Chair of Ways and Means Educate, uh, uh, General Fund. He's new. And then Representative Jim Hill from St. Clair County will once again head up Judiciary. Uh, you know, other than Rex Reynolds, we have a pretty good sense of who the other players are, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and they're not, you know, uh, they're not crazy. Um, you know, uh, I think that's the one thing that you can kind of note out of this is that some of the crazier members were excluded from, uh, positions of, of leadership because except for one uh, that was voted in. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that uh, in that regard, it gives me a little bit of hope. Um, you know, I mean, there's a certain level of crazy that goes with all Republicans from, you know, my perspective. But, um, your perspective. And, and, you know, yeah. for I, I think overall, though, these are basically people that can work with, especially Jim Hill. You know, Jim Hill on the judiciary there is, uh, it's he's been... Um, I, honestly, I, to me, Jim Hill is, is one of my favorite uh, lawmakers of all time, which will probably hurt Jim Hill tremendously <laughs> in his <laughs> perception. Uh, but I'm sorry. But listen, I don't judge him based on, on Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative sort of things. I, I judge him on, on what he's tried to do, uh, on taking yeah. issues, complicated, complex issues, and breaking things down and trying to do good things for the state of Alabama. And that's, that's all you can hope for out of a lawmaker. Well, Susan, you and I have known uh, Judge Jim Hill for a yes. long, long time. I still call him Judge. <laughs> and uh, he is one of the smartest men you're going to meet. And he mm-hmm. is thoughtful. He's conservative. But he is conservative with a brain. He's, like con- well, he's conservative <laughs> from a standpoint of he does what he thinks is right in a situation. Whether it leans liberal or whether it leans conservative, he's going to lean conservative because that's who he is. It doesn't necessarily have to do with the party itself. He's just fair-minded. I mean, these guys that we've got now in these leadership positions are more business-minded type of people. Yeah. And, of course, you know, Jim Hill being in, in, in Judy, that's that's a little different than the other three. But I think I think we're, we're looking at a maybe a more calm and uh, reasonable quadrennium this time. Well, I think, you know, it, and, and there are other chairs to be filled, but these are the major ones. Yeah. And to me, this showed that Ledbetter is showing a, a, a conservative, mm-hmm. moderate approach to governing. And I just don't mean moderate in a bad sense. I mean, no. sensible governing. Right. Common sense governing. Right. Because these people that we know, Danny Garrett, uh, Jim Hill, of course, and uh, Joe Lavorn, he's uh, they, these are reasonable people. Again, we don't know Rex Reynolds very well, but we're we're gonna get we'll to learn. know him. We're we'll gonna learn. get to know him. But I think it it to me it's a very hopeful sign of good government, and and that's what we're looking. Yeah, for. yeah. I mean, it's uh, a 
it, you know, look, whenever you can get as much crazy out of it as possible, it's it's good government. And you know, yeah. and what I, all I'm saying about the about Jim Hill is is it, th- listen, there's a conservative and liberal approach to things. I, I get that. I get that people get all caught up on that. But basically, what you're looking for is somebody that that's going to go in and govern. And I don't care if they have a conservative mindset, as long as is everybody's reasonable about their approach to stuff and consistent. You know, mm-hmm. and we don't waste time on nonsense. It doesn't help anybody. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it, there's going to be 26 new members in the House, 26 new Republican members, I mean. Mm. And so uh, there's been some conversation that because there's so many newbies, you, you won't be able to get anything done. But mm. I, 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 we would be silly to forget a decade ago when the Republicans took over the House and the Senate. Uh, they were There were so many newbies uh, that yeah. nobody knew where the bathroom was. And they got a lot of stuff done. Now, the question is whether it was good stuff, but they got a lot of stuff done and because of leadership, Josh. Oh, yeah, they did. Got a lot of indictments, too. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, they got a lot of stuff done. Uh, not all of it was legal, but they got a lot of stuff no. done. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, you're right. They did, um, and and listen, you can you can look at uh, the lack of knowledge as uh, you know good or bad if you're in a leadership position, uh, <laughs> because I think you can steer. Uh, you know, if, uh, if you're Nathaniel Ledbetter now, you can steer a lot of guys in the right direction and educate them in a hurry on things that need to get done, and right. and get those things passed uh, before they get caught up in the web of lobbyists and special interest groups and stuff. Yeah. Uh, you can you can pu- put them in the, on the right path well, well they did so with the ethics reforms i yeah. mean that was pretty quick that they got that one done you got the competitive bid law uh job creation tax incentives and the immigration laws i mean that went pretty quick the immigration law however did not go exactly well, the way no, they wanted it to there, yeah. yeah that yeah. hb 56 will go down in infamy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a lot of that bill left yeah. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. But it is true. But they did get it done. As my <clears throat> it will go down. Then leadership will be key here. And I, I agree. You, you know, uh, if you say a new broom sweeps clean, it, it needs an old hand probably to guide it. And yeah. I think that that's think where that's this type of leadership that we're seeing here is going to be fundamental to passing good things. Because you're never going to get more done. Than, than the first year of the quadrennium. Absolutely. Uh, you know, because you've got a long time before you have to answer to the voters again. Uh, so it's a good time to get get a good good amount of stuff done that might seem controversial. Right. Any, we got about 20 seconds. Anything? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. This is a, this will be the sanest year that we have, okay? Because you don't you don't have any elections on the near future. People will yeah. long forget whatever happens here uh, as soon as you do it. And so, just do the good things, get the big things done, and get them out of the way. Gambling, get it done. <laughs> as we say, uh, go big or go home. Right? Exactly. Right. All right, we're gonna leave it right there. You're watching the Be the Voice of Alabama Politics. We'll be right back. Throughout my career, I've seen many crashes, and a lot of the fatalities are from people who haven't worn their seatbelt. Cars have rolled over multiple times. I've had people end up in lakes, um, ravines. I've been looking for people in the woods for a couple hours before. Usually just about every bone in their body is broken, their organs have ruptured, and typically they die. You want to save a life, just simply click a button and put the seatbelt on. Seatbelts really do save lives. biggest factors in a fatal car crash. Your car stops, but your body does not stop at the same time. Your body keeps going, you know, and that could be running into your seatbelt, that could be hitting the airbag, something has to stop it, and unfortunately it's something very hard. There have been times that we've come upon accidents where if people weren't speeding, they'd probably still be alive today. It's truly dangerous and it puts everybody at risk. There's just no point to it. This kind of stuff has got to stop.
Welcome back to the V, the voice of Alabama politics. Uh, you know, Josh, I think you hit the nail right on the head here. Uh, you, you kind of slyly said gambling. Governor Kay Ivey is in the best position politically, wide mandate to govern. She knows how to use her position to get things done. And uh, she's only she's got four years left. There, she's reached the pinnacle in Alabama. She, there's nothing else she can do. I'd like to see her go out on a high note. Mm -hmm. And that would, one of those things is gambling. The other one is health care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Speaker Ledbetter or Speaker nominee Ledbetter was on the radio uh, last week. And he said, might be difficult uh, to get uh, a gaming bill passed. He didn't say it was impossible. He thinks it might get a bill uh, through because of the young uh, leader, not leadership, but the young people in the legislature, not necessarily the, the, the age, newcomers, newcomers yeah. in the legislature. But Josh and Susan, we know that when Governor Kay Ivey makes up her mind, she can get past whatever she wants passed. And I think for the good of the state, we need to put this gambling issue to bed once and for all. We do. I mean, we've got, you know, the taxes that we can get from this would be great. We cut out all the illegal stuff that's going on. And once and for all, put this issue to bed. It's time. I mean, all we're doing here is letting the people vote. It's not yeah. like you're up and down that you want gaming. You're voting for the newcomers. You're voting to let the people vote on whether they want it or not. Josh, for the last decade, we've heard from politicians, oh, we want to pass a bill. We want to let the people vote. Mm -hmm. But every year they have an excuse why they can't get it done. I think it's, Kay Ivey should be tired of all the excuses. Yeah, no, and, and I think you're right uh, about Kay Ivey needing to get involved in this. Um, yeah, and, and I think if she does, that will be the last uh, little push that this thing needs because we've got a um, – uh, we've got a uh, – a legislature that was ready to pass this, all right? And so w all we need to do is push this thing across the finish line. And we're talking about a comprehensive gaming bill that is going to bring in roughly a billion dollars a year for the state. It's going to set up uh, uh, these resort-style casinos in, in major locations around the state. And we're going to have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 jobs created. So this is an overall positive thing. And, and I, would, I would bet you that by passing this, we're actually going to have less gambling in the state than we currently have. Uh, because we've right. got illegal gambling <clears throat> shops popping up everywhere and a comprehensive bill would put some regulation into this thing and put some teeth into the law that would stop a lot of these little back of the gas station things that keep popping up uh, left and right uh, and, and funding you know, a, a lot of very shady people. Uh, in the meantime, you could put these things in locations and reward Alabama businesses, reward the Porch Creek Indians for being good neighbors, uh, you know, uh, and have good stewards of your of your money and of your state uh, to be in control of this. And I, I don't know at this point why we're doing it, because if she wants to get anything done outside of the norm, she's going to need the money for gambling. Absolutely. And we've said it and said it and said it. We already have gambling in Alabama. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is have legal gambling, which is fully regulated and taxed. This yes. is what we need. And this is a very simple thing. I'm sorry, you, you, I, I'm not a gambler either, but it doesn't mean I'm stupid. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we've got gambling, let's, let's regulate it, decide what's legal, what's not, and get it done. I think that's, that's where we're at. But anyway, we'll see what they do. Uh, yeah, no, you're 100 percent right about about what you just said. Though, I mean, this is this is a, an issue that's just laying there for somebody. It, it's honest to God, it's nonsense that we haven't done this by now, and that we walk uh, around pretending that this this isn't taking place here. We have all the problems and all the gambling that we would uh, we would have under this bill already. What we don't have is revenue to compensate for some of the problems that's created. That's absolutely true, and and this is, there's only one way to fix it. And that's go in, do the hard work, and and get it done. If it were me, I'd walk in the, I, as soon as the state of the state was over, I would call a special session and put them to work and yeah. say, we're going to stay here until we get it done. Uh, I, that's just the way I feel about it. Hey, some more good news this week. Uh, 
Hel Helena Duncan was named CEO and president of the Business Council of Alabama. Ms. Duncan will be the first African-American to lead that august body. Mm -hmm. And she is a, a businesswoman. She has mm -hmm. had a storied career. And it is, it's not only another woman, a woman of color, and I think, Susan, it's a bright day at BCA. I think it's a bright day at BCA. She's got a lot of experience in the financial industry. And I think it's going to be a, a, a great new, fresh breath of air for BCA. Yeah. Josh, yeah. always good to see minorities rise. Uh, and, and BCA is about time they had somebody. Yeah, absolutely. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, the the chairman of the of the board is also African American man. And so this is, uh, right. I mean, the, the the BCA is is making good strides um, in, in that regard. And listen, I the I think we we've reported on this at APR a lot. And the uh, the rise of of the of black owned businesses in this state is the future of this state from from a yeah. financial standpoint. And so positioning yourself there to, to welcome in minorities and to make the business community more accepting and by extension, the entire state more accepting of, of African-Americans in leadership roles is, is something that's really phenomenal and they should be congratulated for it. And, and this is an inclusive BCA, mm -hmm. unlike we have seen. This all started with Katie Britt. It did. Uh, Katie Britt came in uh, with the board that she had. They made it more inclusive they reached out to more minority businesses. Mm -hmm. And therefore, yeah. this is the fruit of what we're seeing now. And right. uh, we, we wish Ms. Duncan all the success in the world uh, over at BCA. I think all in all, and Josh, I know you want 100% agree with me, and I don't 100% agree with myself. It looks like 2023 is shaping up to be a year where we can actually get stuff done rather than running around about all these silly social issues that take up so much time and accomplish nothing. Well, I, listen, I, I don't know that I can agree that that's what it's gonna, what's going to happen because I, I know who's in charge. Uh, but um, I can tell you that I sure hope that that's the case. Uh, and, you know, I think that there, you know, no matter what the rhetoric is and campaign slogans are and things like that, I think that we all know and pretty much all agree on the major issues that face this state. And I think that we all we need to do is sit down at the table and, and come together on solutions that, that will fix, that will address our education issues, that will address some of the, uh, the medical issues that we have in this state. Uh, and I think we can do that if people just put aside some of the silliness. I agree. All right. We're going to have to leave it right there. You've been watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. You watch us because we watch them.